One of the first items I've collected uh, over the years was uh, a door from uh, George Burns' house. And I met him one time in his driveway. He was a really nice guy. He always drove home uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon. You could tell he was gonna be there. He always saw the little, uh, the little head with the glasses just above the dashboard. But he was coming home one night and I introduced myself to him and he was terrific and very nice. And I noticed in the back there was sort of a pool house. And uh, so George died and I understand this house was sold before he died, so a couple of weeks after he died, it was emptied out. And there was this large dumpster in his driveway, and I noticed that uh, several of the doors from that pool house that I'd seen earlier uh, were out in the dumpster. So a friend of mine, <laughs> Steve and I, went out there. I was driving a Dodge Colt, tiniest little thing in the world, and we, we liberated two of these doors from George Burns' garbage. We had nothing to fasten them on in my Dodge Colt. We're driving down, <laughs> driving down Sunset, in Beverly Hills with these two doors hanging out the window, hanging onto these things on both sides. And now the door uh, sits proudly in my home. <laughs> Divine, his real name was Harris Glenn Milstead and Divine started in Baltimore doing films for John Waters. The only person as far as I know to actually ever eat dog droppings in a movie and that, that's Pink Flamingos and it made him and John Waters very famous. Now Divine died in 1988 at the Regency Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard. The, uh, the hotel was uh, scheduled to be torn down. I hopped a fence with my friend Brian, found the room that Divine died in. I was looking for a souvenir to take because I collect souvenirs. The only thing I could really find was the door. And uh, this is the door from Divine's room. See, I even have the uh, autopsy report, which talks about the room number on it. And there's a picture of us liberating it. It really makes my house look shitty. <laughs> Now, on the morning of June 25th, 2009, about one o'clock that morning, he contacted his personal physician, Dr. Conrad Murray, and told him that he was having a problem sleeping and he was dehydrated. So Murray came over and uh, Michael Jackson requested what he called milk, which was propofol, the, the, the thing we all know about. It's a sedative that's used for people that are going through surgery or people in chronic pain, not for insomnia. So Conrad Murray uh, had uh, given Jackson his propofol. And now Murray claims that he never left Jackson's side except for uh, to, use, to use the restroom the next morning. And for two minutes, he stepped back in and Jackson was having uh, a problem breathing. So he performed CPR on him. Now, in reality, there's a 90 minute period of time that's unaccounted for uh, prior to the 911 call that was made from Jackson's home. During that time, there were three phone calls made on Murray's phone, uh, totaling 47 minutes. One of them was uh, supposedly to Michael Jackson's personal physician, Arnie Klein, uh, where he was asking for advice. One was apparently to a lawyer, and the other one might possibly have been to Conrad Murray's girlfriend, who claims herself that uh, she heard Murray uh, react when Michael Jackson's lifeless body was found. But 911 was called. Michael Jackson was unresponsive. They took him to Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center and worked on him for another two hours. Now, at the, Michael was already gone. He had been flatlined back at the home. So two hours later, if they revived him, it was not going to be a good thing. But uh, he was pronounced dead two hours after the ambulance was called to the home. Now, in Jackson's bedroom were a laptop, a book, eyeglasses, several bottles of orange juice, and a closed jar of urine were surrounding the bed. Also found were condom catheters, and in the very bed that Jackson was found in was one of those blue plastic pads lined with cotton, uh, you know, usually used for urination issues. I, I'm not saying that that's the case. These are just the facts. What's interesting about Jackson's death is that Michael Jackson's fans, they could be the sanest people in real life. 
you know, you're talking about lawyers and, and people in their 40s and, you know, just really successful business people. But when it comes to Michael Jackson, they fall to pieces. I mean, I've spoken to people, you know, highly educated people that are broken down to tears because of this, you know, basically pop star's death. And I, I'm not dismissing that. What people do in their grief is, is a very personal thing. I just find it interesting. And Michael Jackson fans are, are positively rabid, some of them. I mean, the coroner's office are still inundated with people that just do not believe that Michael Jackson is dead. I mean, people are, are creating phony videos showing Michael Jackson being, you know, carted away out of the coroner's office. It's just, it's crazy what has happened since then. But, uh, we're in Holmby Hills right now. Behind me is a 17,000 square foot home that Michael Jackson was renting and where Michael Jackson died on June 25th of 2009. The bedroom that Michael Jackson uh, died in apparently is, uh, is that one, the tall one at the very top. Behind me is another tour bus in front of Michael Jackson's house. Now, I've been in this business for about 15 years or so, and people always look down at us like we're ghouls, like we're doing something really awful, and now it's like become so mainstream, everyone's doing it. There was very famous cell phone footage that somebody that was on a tour bus took of Michael being taken out of those gates. Now, there were Christmas wreaths on those gates back then, and they stayed there for uh, several months after Michael Jackson died. Uh, he had been renting this house for $100,000 a month. Jermaine Jackson held a press conference announcing the details of Michael's death and him being picked up and worked over for two hours and, uh, and requested that the media leave his family alone to grieve in private. Then he invited 26,000 people to the Staples Center and put a big gold box in the middle of it for privacy. And uh, the televised funeral held at uh, Forest Lawn Glendale, where he is entombed in the Great Mausoleum, which is the holy grail of cemeteries in Los Angeles. They say the entire bill for the funeral uh, was about $900,000, including all the clothing, and etc. Now, the weirdest thing about it, since Michael Jackson's death was ruled a homicide, and homicide doesn't necessarily mean murder. It just means that he didn't die at his own hands, that someone else may have had something to do with, the, uh, with his death. And uh, since Michael Jackson, it was two months before he was buried, and basically he was in a cooler at Forest Lawn. And since it was now ruled a drug death, they went back to Forest Lawn. A coroner's aide went to Forest Lawn, or the chief of operations for the county coroner went, and, uh, and a Forest Lawn representative, and Latoya Jackson and, her, and a man that was with her uh, went to Forest Lawn. They opened up Jackson's casket, and they, were, uh, they had to remove his wig, because he was, he was bald, uh, I mean, well, male pattern baldness. And uh, he also had tattoos, eyes, and, and he had his hairline tattooed, so it didn't look like he was wearing a wig, and pink uh, on his lips, tattooed. Uh, but anyway, they were plucking hairs from Michael Jackson's head uh, at this with Latoya looking on. It's just a very weird kind of ghoulish scene. Uh, so they could diagnose or they could check the hair out and examine the hair for uh, chemical content. We're on the Hollywood Walk of Fame right now, which is run by the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. When it first started 50 years ago, it was an honor to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But now that honor costs $25,000. So for 25 grand, you get the privilege of uh, hanging out with Britney Spears and a bunch of holes in the sidewalk. Even Absolute Vodka now has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. That's how precious these stars are. I think tours are as good as the guides that give them. I would say that probably 90% of the tour guides out here want to be famous. Or they came out here to be actors or something like that. And thus, their tour reflects their lack of interest in the subject matter. I've been on several tours. I've been on a tour where there was a guy that uh, had uh, Mel Gibson and Tom Cruise and Robert De Niro and Harrison Ford living next door to each other, all on the same street. And if you know where they live, you know the Mel's in Malibu, Malibu, Tom Cruise in Beverly Hills, and Robert De Niro lives in New York. They don't even have a house in LA. But people from visiting, taking these tours, don't know that. And there are exceptions, but they are rare, rare exceptions. I'm gonna keep an eye out for movie stars. 
And celebrities on this movie star home tour. Directly in front of me, that is Hollywood High School. Hollywood High School, the filming location for the movie Grease. John Travolta was in that oh my movie. God, so was it. Grease was not filmed there. This is the last Hollywood Hills home of Dean Martin. Oh my God, it's so not. These the aircraft like multi-millionaires. Years years. We go by Jennifer Aniston's house. Jennifer Aniston is doing very well, you guys. That is fascinating. Oh. <laughs> to your right, you guys. There's no one other than Silence of the Lamp, Jodie Foster. Uh, I don't see her car out front, though. That's because really she moved cool. away. Jodie Foster hasn't lived there in ages. You'll see the Yellow Mansion. That's Simon Cowell, you guys. American Idol all the way up there. Simon. He does not live anywhere near. This guy coming up. In On the corner is a guy that sells star maps. So we're going to pick one up just to see. Courtney Cox, no. She hasn't lived there in years. Danny DeVito, okay, he is there. Monica Lewinsky, she made the star maps. Faye Dunaway, no. Oh, it's his past home. Who cares where Faye Dunaway used to live? Eddie Murphy, Benedict, no. Toby McGuire, he's moved, no. Madonna moved out of Roxbury years ago. It still has Engelbert Humperdinck's house here, which was torn down about five years ago. George Burns lived at a home in Beverly Hills for like 50 years, and it has a name, an address in Encino for him, but Charo's house is right. <laughs> God, you know what? These are just, these maps suck.